Congress's vision of the goal for our nation's water is the restoration and maintenance of the chemical, physical, biological integrity of the nation's water. Have we met that goal yet? Anybody? I don't think so. Um, programs for the control of non-point source of pollution be developed and implemented in an expeditious manner. 30 years and we're still struggling with this issue. Undisturbed by human activity, Virginia's forests and wetlands absorb and filter rainwater. Water seeps into the ground where it works its way through the soil towards springs and small streams. Released by the soil as sparkling clean water, it becomes a life-giving source during both wet and dry years to thousands of plants and animal species, including humans. But in areas we have disturbed by cutting down forests, by filling in springs, streams, and wetlands, and by covering soil with pavement, lawns, and buildings, we have hindered nature's ability to provide us and other life forms with clean water. Pollution, soil sediment, and decaying organic matter were once controlled by forests, wetlands, and small streams. They now flow untreated into Virginia's waterways. Streams and rivers quickly rise and flood more often than before development occurred. They also flow at lower levels during dry periods. As communities grow, the hard surfaces of rooftops, roads, and parking lots speed the flow of polluted, untreated stormwater into storm drains or local streams and ultimately down to the Chesapeake Bay. We now know that damage to our rivers and the Chesapeake Bay is caused by the way we build buildings and develop land. The damage has cost billions of dollars to taxpayers and resulted in the creation of many government regulations. For the past 30 years, while population and development have grown in Virginia, Professionals have been studying and designing ways to recreate how forest and wetlands slow down and clean Virginia's stormwater. They know we have to recreate the natural rising and falling of streams and rivers during and after storms. They know we need a system of design strategies that will allow us to develop the land, allow us to lead productive lives, and have clean, drinkable water all at the same time. I want to introduce the father of modern stormwater management, Bill Shaver. We've been implementing our traditional stormwater controls, but we're still seeing degraded environments in our, in our urban streams. We have to start aiming higher in what we're doing. Imagine you as a human being if 90% of your arteries were clogged and we couldn't have a healthy system. If we don't do a good job of protecting these small stream systems, in the U.S. it's 70% of all streams are first and second order streams. So that's something that we really need to, to be more aggressive on is protection of these very small urban systems. The developer came in and this was his approach. Uh, traditional stormwater treatment ponds in the center with 128 lots. We worked with the developer and said, can we give you a better design? It lowered the uh, peak runoff for a two-year storm by 21% just by how you develop the land. His yield went from 128 lots to 138 lots and that the subdivision cost dropped by a million and a half dollars. What's interesting in this project is the profit margin for the developer went from 24 percent up to 34 percent. So he made more money with less impact. I mean it's a win-win situation. Designing a system that recreates nature's water cleaning methods, that allows communities to grow and prosper, that protects our streams, rivers, and the Chesapeake Bay, that holds the cost to property owners rather than to taxpayers, is called low-impact development. Low-impact development involves a lot of uh, various techniques. We're here at an elementary school where we used all the different techniques. There's really five steps to low-impact development. 
First step with low impact development is conservation. I'm standing in front of five acres of trees we were able to save on this site uh, just through sensitive site planning. And in Virginia, developers are learning that they too can make more money by conserving land and making more efficient use of land. We purchased this property, Camp Glen Kirk, which consists of 227 acres on the shores of Lake Manassas. We decided to spend the money up front in more detailed engineering to arrive at a more environmentally sensitive land plan for this community. The site is quite unique. It has a uh, eagle's nest on it, matter of fact, two eagle's nests, and it has majority of the site is wetlands. And uh, so by spending the money up front in the engineering, we were able to come up with a land plan that basically saves 55% of the site in open space and becomes a very environmentally friendly community which we think is a very strong marketplace to sell homes. By using some of the uh, low impact design techniques that are um, on the marketplace today, many of those techniques are very, very advantageous to the developer and we find them financially rewarding to us too and we find that it would probably be most advantageous for the homeowner and the consumer at the end. One of the initial concepts that we had for the project was to do a modified cluster design which would uh, cluster and condense the area for home ownership to a smaller portion of the site uh, rather than lot it out over the entire site. That gave us control over the preservation of the open space and trees that we have on this property. The second part of low impact development is uh, minimization of impacts. A recent study found that the damage done to water quality by every square foot of pavement must be offset by six square feet of heavily planted landscape. The most efficient approach to protect our water is to reduce the amount of pavement and the footprint of buildings. There are now alternatives to pavement for roads, driveways, and parking lots that receive only occasional usage. These grass-covered structures are strong enough to hold large vehicles. Where pavement is necessary, there are products that allow water to pass through them into a specially prepared underground system. The third part of LID is slowing the water down. This is simply done in this case by taking the downspouts and disconnecting them from a pipe system and allowing it to drain out onto the landscape. Another practice that we use is, is house water tanks. The first step to collecting rainwater is to calculate how much water runs off the roof. A 1,000 square foot roof may have 600 gallons of rainwater runoff for every inch of rain. And as this seasoned expert says... So you've got a rain barrel, it's large enough, it's freeze-thaw tested, it's UV proof, and uh, it's child proof, it's animal proof, it's mosquito proof. We have sizes ranging from 30 gallons up to 15,000 gallons. There are many different types of uh, configurations. You can get them in all different types of sizes, dimensions, and also color configurations that match the environment match the aesthetics of a house, um, any type of application where you're wanting to fit it into your environment, that's where it you know, becomes um, very important to look at that type of detail. Herbert Dreisaitl is designing systems in Virginia that will integrate stormwater into our daily lives rather than hiding it underground. I think it is important for people to understand what uh, their water is in front of their doorstep. I think it's important to, get it, to make it clear that the runoff of water is open to sea, is clear for people. They have to get a feeling and an understanding of their environment and they have to relate to it. It should also be, in a way, uh, funny, it should be interesting, it should be part of our culture. It's something for all. The fourth step with low impact development is to uh, use integrated management practices where we create storage within the landscape to recreate the storage that was lost when we developed. And this is an example of how we lose storage. This isn't an LID technique. You can see how the landscape is mounted up so there's no opportunity to treat the water or to store it. Essentially water just runs off and it's disconnected from, uh, from the parking lot. 
A good example here of uh, integrated management practice is a rain garden here with this landscape island. You can see how it's depressed and it has the vegetation growing in it. Uh, curb cuts allow the water to get into this area where it can be treated and stored uh, and uh, provide stormwater management benefits. The design has been based on improving the water quality of the 0.6 acres. This is a good location for a rain garden because we have got a lot of runoff coming from a parking lot and also from these rooftops and part of the lawn. All of the stormwater management for this new building is done using low impact development techniques. The courtyard is the center of the building and it's also where the stormwater management takes place. The stormwater management takes place in two different areas. Where we're standing right now is the green roof. We're on the roof above the sublevels of the building and just to my left we have three feet of soil with the plants above. Behind me where I just walked up from is the on-grade bioretention area. There we have six to seven feet of soil with larger plants. And it, it, in this system, every raindrop that falls comes to the courtyard. Either it falls on the roof of the building and comes down through the downspouts that you see arrayed around the perimeter. It comes then across the shallow runnels set into the sidewalks and feeds the surface of both the green roof and the bioretention. Or the rain that falls in the back in the parking lot, which is behind me through the gate, is caught in a shallow catchment basement and feeds to the surface of the on-grade bioretention. Well, what we have here is about a one-acre parking lot that drains to the Rappahannock River. There's not much in the way of stormwater management here right now. So we came back and took a look at the site to see where we could apply some LID principles to try and get the water back into the ground and make it function a little more like it did when it was a pre-developed uh, forest. This is where the water goes right now and what we're going to be doing is taking this green island here and turning it into a, a functional filter or biofilter. And that's going to happen right here at the curb cut. Um, when all is said and done on this project, the first flush of rainfall is going to enter right through here and it's going to come back into this excavated area. We've just begun digging it out. Once we get um, the rest of the soil removed, we are going to take out the existing soil because um, this is not permeable enough to, um, to allow the good type of filtration that we want to have in a biofilter unit. So we're going to take this soil out and then fill it up with the uh, standard bioretention profile, really, which uh, starts with gravel as a sump to hold the water and then moves up into the um, bioretention soil mix with mulch on top. And we'll come back in here plant it with a river birch, some blue flag iris, um, some mulch on top. The whole thing will be depressed about six inches below where grade is now. It'll probably only pond for um, an hour or so after a rainstorm event, but um, we've taken this parking lot and made it a lot more functional from an LID perspective. We're in my front yard here in Stafford County, Virginia. We moved here about two years ago. And when we first moved in, we had all kinds of drainage problems. None of this landscaping was here, and we had water after heavy rains that would flow and puddle up in the back and create a swamp over here to my right. We were able to solve all those problems and improve our landscaping at the same time by putting in a rain garden in the front yard here, which has added a nice addition to our landscape. Some flowers, some trees, it looks great. In addition, we put a swale in in the backyard, runs along the width of our backyard, and that has solved our puddling problems in the back and probably saved the foundation of our house as well. The final thing we did was along the front of the house, we have taken our ditch here and taken out all the ugly riprap rock and all the weeds, put in a swale and covered it with some ground cover that'll fill in over the years and create an additional beautiful part of our landscape. This is my private urban, ultra urban backyard habitat. This property I bought about 10 months ago and what you could see here did not exist. It was concrete and chain link fence. When it rained, all the water from the downspout would run directly onto the alley and would create a stormwater management problem. I did put in a, um, a bluestone patio which is just sitting in 
crushed stone, so it is pervious. But more importantly, all the storm water that comes from the downspout from the, the entire roof runoff is being directed into this uh, bioretention area right here. Excess water after it pools here is directed via this uh, drainage detail over to this side right here where it is allowed to maintain and to retain and to slowly infiltrate into the ground just aiding the plant growth and I have not irrigated this site um, since I planted it about in April of this year. We're here in a large commercial parking lot in uh, the city of Fredericksburg. This is really where some of the first LID activities took place in the city. One of the things that you notice when you enter into this area, uh, you see the conventional parking lot islands over my shoulder and the vegetation there. And you contrast that with the bioretention area here in the middle of the parking lot and the vigorous growth that's going on here. This is really one of the many kind of value-added uh, benefits that come along with bioretention systems. Because we're utilizing the stormwater runoff here to irrigate the trees in the parking lot, there's no need for an extensive uh, irrigation infrastructure. That saves money. It also um, creates much more vigorous growth as the trees remove the nutrients from the runoff, grow much more vigorously, and um, create a, an aesthetic asset here in the parking lot, uh, plenty of shade and what otherwise really is a sea of asphalt. Uh, one of the neat things about this project here is that the success of this led the developer, when we worked with them on their next project, to actually decide to go ahead and do complete LID across their entire development. I wanted to show you a little bit of the design that really incorporates the principles of how the water flows and how it has to be caught and brought to these basins. You can see that it comes down the face of the building and into a series of rills and what, what we wanted to do was to be able to teach people how water flows through the landscape so not to put it in a closed pipe but to put it in a system that has some openness and that allows the sound of the water to be heard as it rushes down from the top of the building into the rills and then into these basins. The water actually rushes quite fast and and there's quite a lot of volume of water coming off a, a building the size of this and so the water comes into the rills and then the velocity is slowed down by this series of river cobbles which are natural Virginia river cobbles and it's brought into the basins where it begins to moisten the plantings and and then infiltrate back into the ground so the system works very cleanly and it's not a new system it's a kind of system that's been around and used for many thousands of years and we're really kind of coming back to that after having paved and piped water for many, many years since the 1940s. We're here today at Baker Butler Elementary School to see the bus loop biofilter installed in 2002 to treat the runoff from the bus loop in the parking area. All of the storm water from the bus loop and parking area enters the biofilter through this curb cut. The stone dissipator channel is used to take some of the energy from the water before it enters the biofilter. In this biofilter, the school wanted a lawn, so instead of planting shrubs and hardwood mulch, we planted grass and large trees. University of Virginia did a study on this biofilter on the removal of pollutants, and they could measure the water coming in off the parking lot, but when they came down here to, to measure the water coming out, very often there wasn't enough water coming out. So that shows how efficient these biofilters can be at stormwater treatment. The soil mix that was used in this rain garden was a sterile purchased mix which contained a very large amount of sand and very little organic matter and no soil animals whatsoever. So what happened over time was that silt contained in the runoff coming off of this parking lot flowed onto the surface of this soil and compacted the soil down and created an impermeable layer on the top. What would happen in a natural soil is that earthworms would burrow around in the t upper layers of the soil and they would mix this silt into the soil matrix. Now the problem here is that there are no earthworms in this soil and there's very little organic matter. So when this silt washes in, nothing happens. My advice to anybody building a rain garden would be to add a lot of organic matter and import a lot of worms. Vegetated or green roofs have also been used for thousands of years. These green roofs, just outside of Washington, D.C., were built in the early 1970s and represent the ancient design of green roofs. A new style of green roof is lightweight and can be built onto already existing buildings. 
Some countries now require green roofs on all new buildings. These roofs are quickly becoming popular in Virginia for their stormwater value, the superior way they insulate the building, their longevity, and the way they look. Green roofs are one of the most effective technologies in urban areas available to you to manage your storm water. Green roofs are a very effective technology because it retains water, it filters water, it delays water, it reduces the temperature of urban runoff and it also takes up some of the nutrients that otherwise would be washed into our urban streams as non-point source pollution. Hi, come on up. A week after it was installed, Isabel hit. It did just fine. The sedum survived the winter, and I expect to get 40 plus years out of this green roof. And look, we've taken 4,500 square feet of impervious surfaces and turned it into a pervious surface. This roof was constructed strictly for the longevity of the roof to save the community money to decrease the cost of heating the buildings and for stormwater management. We also have a unique design to the, uh, the way we handle the runoff. We have an open section, six foot ditch, grass ditch, that occurs on both sides of the street rather than curb and gutter. This converts to 4.2 miles of swale along both sides of the street, which is a pervious surface, allowing infiltration to occur the entire length of it, as well as reducing the velocities, which you would normally not have in a curb and gutter situation. That three acres is an area that we can flow water across, which cleanses the water and reduces the velocity as well. The fifth step with low impact development is public education and outreach. Education includes teaching how to prevent pollution and soil sediment from entering our storm drains and streams. Education also includes showing how low impact development designs are cost effective and attractive opportunities for landowners and developers. Prevention through education is the least expensive way to keep our waters clean. We're looking at the very first biofilter that was installed in this whole area of Virginia. And the county did it as a demonstration project to basically show what this biofilter technology is all about and to promote it to the private sector. And one of the great things about this particular biofilter is it's used as part of the educational process for the school. Low impact development workshops are gaining popularity and have been very effective in helping government staff, architects, contractors, and developers support these new designs. Many LID design competitions are being funded by government agencies, universities, and builder associations in a successful attempt to encourage more professionals and students to gain skills in this field. I'm part of a team that took second place in the National Student Low Impact Development Competition. This is showing our proposed design for the Virginia Tech Architecture School. We found that we were able to reduce the runoff from the building by about half. Pilot projects are really a critical thing um, in watershed restoration. You really have to show, you know, no matter where I go, you hear, oh, it's an East Coast thing, it's a West Coast thing, or it won't work here. You really have to get some in-ground examples. Everything made by people needs maintenance to perform well over long periods of time. Low-impact development projects are no different. Education doesn't stop when a project is built. Successive landowners must understand the purpose and requirements of their stormwater facilities. We're walking by the Commonwealth's first rain garden. This rain garden was uh, created in 1994. And as you can see, the water flows down along the curve and then there's this curb cut. Everything is looking good. We've just got the problem with the invasive species, the English ivy, but that's, uh, that's going to be rectified with more education and, and maintenance. These rain gardens were constructed in 1996. They're situated on private land and it's the actual homeowners that are responsible for their maintenance. As you can see, this rain garden is not functioning. Uh, it's been more or less barricaded on three of its sides. It will no longer 
allow the water to properly flow in from the driveway and from the roof. It does not have the correct vegetation. There are hardly any plantings that help with the functionality of the rain garden. So the city has really learned a lot. It understands that these homeowners need to be educated and that the city has to have a good plan in place for enforcement. Okay. One of our concerns about the low impact development is that the homeowners will realize this after they've moved onto the property. Uh, that will be disclosed to them when they buy the property. They will understand what the low impact design techniques are and how they're maintained. And this understanding will be part of the homeowners association documents. Landowners, contractors, and local government all play a role in enforcing contracts and agreements to ensure that these low-impact designs are constructed correctly and perform well for many years. One of the important aspects of LID is ensuring good oversight uh, during the construction phase. I think this site here is a really good example. This uh, construction just began here this morning and um, although the, the construction specs say not to do this curb cut here until the very end of the project, it actually got done right at the beginning. And because of that, we've got to be um, extra careful now to make sure water doesn't get in here during the rest of the construction phase or else we're going to end up with a real mess. So um, that's a good example of how important it is um, to be out on site when these are being constructed because a little error like this um, can end up causing a failure with your project. We found that the greatest impediment to low impact design is reliance on infrastructure manuals, codes of practice. They're the ones that have the parking ratios, the street widths, and all of them have to be updated if we're going to, to move in this direction. Stafford County was the first county in the Commonwealth of Virginia to enact low impact development as part of our stormwater ordinance. After we made it part of our stormwater ordinance, we made it part of our planning and zoning ordinances so that it would be uh, as easy as possible to, to use low impact development. Uh, this year we've taken it really one step further and we've made low impact development now required as the basic uh, approach to stormwater. So stormwater management is low impact development in Stafford County, Virginia. Many stormwater structures are expensive to maintain. Many of the conventional ones are failing and may never be working properly, whereas low impact development allows a multitude of solutions that really better fits uh, quite often the land or the nature of the development. Only through the partnership of landowners, contractors, and the government can this change begin. The quality of our water depends on our ability to construct buildings and develop Virginia's land. It must be done in a way that does not pass on the cost of building to downstream taxpayers. Low impact development allows nature, as it did for millions of years, to provide once again an abundance of clean, life-sustaining water.